Um, but let me look a little bit at Sea Alaska. Sea Alaska, and, and uh, you notice I don't say Sea Alaska Corporation, although that is the legal title. The, uh, its leaders have, be, have said they wanted to drop the corporation, even though legally they are a corporation, but they've dropped that corporation uh, from their name. So Sea Alaska is the regional corporation for the Tlingit and Haida Indians of Southeast Alaska, and I noted that the Simpsons have a reservation. Um, it is a profit-making corporation, but it takes great pride in, in that it is a native organization that provides uh, both social and economic benefits for its tribal constituents. It supports the culture of our, the natives, and it advocates politically to advance the welfare of its tribal members and also its communities. What time is it? <clears throat> it's three o'clock. Okay, um, let's move into our core cultural values. Uh, now, I know this sounds like a, an anthropological term, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll take uh, credit for that, uh, but we do have a, a council of traditional scholars, and it meets uh, periodically to look at the programs that are developed by the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, and it talks a lot about uh, the survival of our culture. And um, uh, one of our, our, our members began, said, we need to identify what are the values that really set us apart as Native people. And we have many values, but what they did was they identified uh, four core cultural values. And the first one is Ha'ani, and it simply translates into our land. But when uh, they began a discussion of uh, what our land meant uh, we saw that it is the basis of our collective identity, and it also uh, conveys that uh, we utilize the land, but we also have, uh, and the word they use is uh, revering, revering the land, but we were reluctant to use that, that word because uh, we didn't want people thinking that we were worshiping the land, or uh, which, you know, the missionaries had had characterized uh, our beliefs uh, as, you know, that uh, we worshiped idols. So we didn't want to, you know, we wanted to make sure that we, we stayed away from that concept. Um, the other thing about Ha'ani is, is that it also speaks to a uh, spiritual relationship to our land and also a sustainable relationship to our land. Uh, Hashuka. Hashuka refers to our past, present, and future. And here it means it's our collective identity that uh, ties the current population, the current generation, to our ancestors and also to uh, our future generations. And it, um, it also talks about the san sanctity of our, our cultural and sacred sites and our heritage. And also it, it says that we need to provide social and financial benefits for current and future generations. Hafletsini or Hafletsin means the strength of body, mind, and spirit. And actually the council spent a lot of time on, on this uh, discussing Hafletsin because of their great concern uh, primarily, it was raised with uh, what was happening to Alaska Native men. Alaska Native men seemed to be characterized by a range of social pathologies, alcoholism, high suicide rate. Uh, they weren't doing as well academically. And so what they were doing is they wanted to go back and look, what were the things that guided them in the training of our young men? And, and through that, uh, through those series of meetings, we found out that Hafatsini really was broader than just physical strength, but it applied to uh, strength of mind and spirit. And there was a range of practices to, that the young men and young women uh, received to help them uh, develop uh, discipline, resilience, and perseverance and adaptability. The thing that really struck me is that they were taught to care for their families and communities. And they would actually have some practices like, like uh, wearing an earring 
uh, a stone earring, the weight of it would remind them that they had to care for their families and also their communities, very much ingrained into, um, into their training. The um, uh, uh, other one was Wu Chiach, and this often was translated as respect. However, when uh, we uh, went into a deeper analysis of it, we found out that it actually meant a balance and reciprocity. And, and here we go to our social structure where we see we have eagles and ravens, and we found that any time that an eagle would do something, the ravens were bound to do something in response. So this reciprocal relationship was really important uh, to the Native people. And they actually would say that if, we, if this balance wasn't maintained, if social and spiritual balance wasn't maintained, then the spirits would go wandering and, and cause harm. So uh, this, they, tr they broadened the, the value of respect to really to go back and look at what it meant in the traditional culture. Uh, and so uh, Sea Alaska uh, went. We adopted. Uh, it, we adopted these core cultural values in 2009, and um, we began to have a discussion in Sea Alaska. And uh, uh, the board members said, "Well, if we have the heritage teaching our children that uh, this is, we, they need to live by our four core cultural values if we want to survive as Native people." And here we are, a major institution that owns the land and resources of our ancestors, and we, have, we haven't done anything about our four core cultural values. So in 2012, they adopted, first of all, they adopted uh, the four core cultural values, and then they said uh, we needed a formal strategy as how do we integrate this for our core cultural values uh, into our operations. And I will tell you, this was very exciting, you know, very exciting discussions uh, to hear the board and management. And here is where they, uh, they uh, uh, dropped the boundaries between uh, the board and the managers. And many of our, our officers are Tlingit people, Haida people, uh, young, young educated people. But we got together and we figured out how do we integrate our, our cultural values uh, and how do we make them work in this in this new corporate institution? And I will share something that you know um, somebody said, Rosita, uh, we own a plastics company. How are we going to integrate our cultural value of Haani into a plastics company? And here's where you know being on the board for a number of years, I learned about corporate organization, and I said, well, first of all, we we are not going to be the ones to tell our managers how to do it. They are going to be the ones to tell us how to do it. So we would tell them, we want you to adopt a plan and tell us how you are going to integrate Ha'ani into a plastics company, how you are going to integrate Hospitsini into, into your operations. And then uh, we, I learned uh, another secret, and that was, and, and, and I, here's where we, uh, business school operates on one side, and and we operate on the other. And uh, I said, how about compensation? And so we developed their compensation and incentive plan to measure how they would integrate of our values uh, into the organization. So we adopted that theme, Sea Alaska values into, into action. And um, so um, right now we have a number of initiatives, and I've identified some of them here. Looking at Ha'ani and Hashuka, uh, we are looking at green initiatives in our op op operations, and also I mentioned our compensation. Some of the things that we've done, we've starting to use biomass, um, and that I'll tell you, I have to tell you about the struggles around that. It makes a lot of sense when we live in in a forest to be using biomass. Uh, for energy, uh, we decided that we needed to dedicate part of our lands for monumental art, and that's our canoes and totem poles. Uh, we also became very concerned about, we learned about guitars and guitars using old growth. So we said that we are going to dedicate portions of our land 
uh, for, uh, for monumental art. The other thing is that we uh, set up an LLC, uh, a separate entity that would look at development in our communities because we saw that many of our communities were starting, uh, the, the economy was deteriorating. We saw that our people were moving away from our communities. And you know we have always viewed our strength is that we continue to reside in our homeland, in our community. So, and we know that they need, a, they have to have, in this day and age, they have to have access to a capital economy. So Ha'ani is dedicated to uh, providing uh, lifestyle compatible economic opportunities uh, in our villages. We've also spent uh, you know, millions of dollars protecting our, our subsistence hunting and fishing uh, uh, activities. Uh, we formally adopted our first tree ceremony. We went back to the old traditions of every time we took a tree, we would, uh, there are certain protocols that you would have to do. And so we decided we needed to do that. And there were other kinds of things like bear policies. Uh, we had uh, hunters that wanted to come and take um, uh, bear off of our off of our land. And so uh, we have the bear pol the bear clan is very strong on our board. And so they said we need to figure out how to make sure our cultural values are protected there. And so our other values, Hatsasini uh, and Wuchiach, just some example, we established the Sea Alaska Heritage uh, Institute, uh, and we are now building our Walter Soboloff Center. We established a scholarship endowment. Uh, we award something like $400,000 uh, a year. We establish an intern program. And here is where you see uh, that it's not only traditional training, but it's also education. Education and science becomes very important uh, to our communities. And then also we said we needed to protect our sacred sites. And this is Sea Alaska, a supposedly profit-making corporation that's saying that sacred sites uh, that end up costing us money and not uh, bringing us any revenues are really important. So um, um, that's the, some of the ways that Sea Alaska is uh, um, uh, incorporating our cultural values into the operation. Um, well, I had mentioned that we uh, had received the uh, 7.5 million acres of uh, $7.5 million for the taking of our lands. And um, we, at one point in time, owned all of Southeast Alaska. But today, uh, we see that under ANCSA, we are going to receive only, a, uh, it's actually more than 2% of, of our lands uh, here in Southeast. Uh, we received 291,000 uh, acres to date. And uh, we finally, after 10 years, uh, got Congress to enact legislation that would allow us uh, to receive its final land entitlement of 70,000 acres. And uh, strangely, in our land legislation, this is an Aboriginal land settlement, but uh, uh, it's a long story to tell you about the compromises that we had to make to get that legislation passed. And here's one of them. Uh, we had to have 150 thousand acres, more than twice our land, uh, uh, of lands that went into conservation uh, lands. But uh, I will tell you that the conservation community, although they were you know, working very aggressively to get this 150,000 acres, they were opposed to our 70,000 acres. And so um, here uh, you could see on a map uh, the very small land base uh, uh, that's in pink that represent native ownership of lands uh, in Southeast Alaska. Um, I like to throw this in. I, I know that people have gotten upset when I call ourselves conservation refugees, but in, in our Southeast Alaska, we have so, so much conservation lands. And what we have found is that uh, we are not able to fully implement our subsistence hunting and fishing practices in, in, in much of our land because of the rules and regulations that dictate and restrict 
are, are taking our use of, of the resources. And we actually have a court case coming uh, next month, March 9th. It'll be heard before the Supreme Court here in Alaska. It was our four, four of our fishermen were hunting uh, in and, and Angoon is surrounded by conservation lands. And they were hunting, uh, fishing uh, for our senior citizens home. And the hunters, the fishermen didn't bring all of their permits uh, with them. And uh, so one of them went back to go get their permits and along came fishing game, a fishing game official and cited them all for uh, uh, fishing over the permit limit. So we are challenging that because that rule was uh, implemented uh, by a single bureaucrat. And we said that um, this violated the process of, of establishing rules and regulations through, uh, through through the fishing games and also a very open uh, process. So we have had to spend uh, something like $20 million in the past 10, 15 years to protect our native subsistence rights. Uh, and then there are, you know, I'm just kind of going on through talking about uh, explaining how conservation does affect uh, our land. And, you know, and ironically, uh, we, we support, we actually, you know, support conservation, but in our mind, conservation also uh, includes the use of our land uh, for, for subsistence purposes. So um, it, it's, um, it's really sad to see what's happened to a lot of our people. Uh, we live in this land of plenty, but uh, we've become many of our villages, our people are paupers, and I, I've always said we might as well live uh, in a desert with all of the rich resources that we have around our land, but yet because of the rules and regulations, we're not allowed to harvest those resources. Um, I mentioned that uh, um, we went to Congress to amend ANGSA because it, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, because it violated many of our cultural values. And one was, I mentioned that uh, children who were born after 1971 were not allowed to be enrolled into the corporation. But we said under our traditional values and rules, children have access to lands and have ownership of lands because of their membership in the clan rather than through inheritance. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh -huh. um, and so in, in 2009, we, we, and, and so the compromise in, in uh, Congress was that we wanted an automatic enrollment, but uh, Congress said, no, you have to have a, a resolution and vote on it. So we brought that to our shareholders. And I will tell you, I was the chair of the uh, committee that was overseeing this. And I was, it was just, sitting on pins and needles, wondering if our people were going to support this communal right, not individual right. And um, so uh, we voted on the shareholder descendant ones, and then we also then voted to give special benefits to our elders. And so we gave uh, each, special, each elder, once they turned 65, we gave them uh, $2,000 then, and in addition to that, we gave them 100 shares. They already owned 100 shares, but we gave them an additional shares so that they would receive additional funds over and above other shareholders. Um, our land legislation, and this was really interesting because this is uh, almost 30 years after uh, ANGSA was enacted. And at this point in time, we took a look at our history and we said, what is it that we learned from the first 30 years? And what is it that we need to do in the future? So in our land legislation, we said very definitely, we wanted to have economic sustainability. And uh, we wanted to have, we wanted to uh, look at ways that we could monetize our trees, our resources without harvesting them or without utilizing them. So we, uh, so we uh, incorporated the concept of carbon sequestration uh, into our land legislation. In addition to that, we wanted to diversify beyond just uh, timber development. 
and uh, we wanted to have smaller scale development and uh, we were and we were looking at things like ecotourism and our idea also was that we could work with our villages rather than you know larger developments uh, by the corporations we said maybe we could work with some of our village corporations and and help develop uh, economic diversity uh, within our region um, we also talked about um, cultural sustainability okay no this is fine and and so we decided and uh, we wanted to include our historical sites and uh, okay, I mean, Sea Alaska is a profit making corporation, but we are a native organization. And we said it's important for us to own our historical sites. We had initially asked uh, for 4,000 acres, 4,000 of the 70,000 acres to be dedicated to, um, to um, uh, historical sites. But uh, again, I, I just could not understand the opposition to putting land into uh, historical sites. And we ended up having to compromise uh, from 4,000 acres down to 490 acres for 76 sites. And what our, our hope is here is that at some point in time in uh, the future, uh, we are going to be able to transfer those sites to our villages, our village tribes on behalf of the clans. And we already have formal agreements uh, with our tribe, with a number of our tribes, to manage uh, the historic and sacred sites that we already own. So, but at some point in time, we would like to transfer it uh, to the tribes. And um, uh, here is just a map of some of our sacred sites. If I showed you another sites of all of the traditional place names, that the whole map would be uh, filled because. Uh, in our work that we've done here in Sea Alaska Heritage, we have identified 3,300 sites with place names. So, um, I don't know that I'm going to have a lot of time to to get into our our forest practices, but I, I will just very quickly go over it. Um, I, you know that we live in a, a temperate rainforest. And our, our forest has been free of catastrophic forest fires, uh, creating a relatively stable carbon storage units. However, these forests do much more than uh, store carbons. They provide clean air, clean water, wildlife habitat, stream habitat, erosion, and, and, and any number of ecological uh, benefits and functions. Uh, they also provide us natural resources that we have used for thousands and thousands of years. And so here is where it becomes really critical in terms of how do we incorporate our cultural values into our, into our, our use of our land and our resources. And remember one of our, our, our cultural values says that it is a responsibility to take care of our future generations. And the example that I always like to use is that um, one of our one of our basket weavers was out uh, gathering roots, and she said, "Oh, look at how our ancestors loved us so much. They didn't take all of the roots from this tree, but they allowed this tree to survive, so that we can come back in in this generation um, to to harvest uh, roots from this tree." So we needed to figure out how do we do that with our timber harvests. And we couldn't look to our, our sacred practices. We couldn't look to our traditional practices, uh, although we could be guided by those cultural values. And so what we had to do was we had to hire scientists. And uh, we, we unfortunately, I will say that our, our forestry scientists didn't come from Alaska. But we went to uh, Oregon, where they have had the longest history of dealing uh, with uh, uh, timber harvest. And, and we wanted to learn what was it that they have learned. And so we brought scientists uh, to Alaska to help us uh, develop uh, what we think are, are good steward, uh, uh, land stewards practices. What time is it? 
325. Okay. So um, I, I've got for you an, an overview of, uh, I know we people have said that uh, Seal Alaska clear cuts. And uh, if you will go through uh, all of our all of our reports, you will see that uh, we have um, harvested not we have not clear cut all of our lands, but in fact it's it's been fairly minimal. And we do have a chart, you know, um, further on that that looks at the total harvest uh, of our land. And uh, we have only you know received. And if you look at the large tree habitat, and somebody had said, you guys are cutting down all of the trees, all of the large trees uh, in, in uh, Southeast Alaska. And we pulled up this chart. We, we, pulled, we, we got one of our scientists to go and pull up some of our records. And we showed them that there was probably a large, the large tree habitat was something like 2.3 million acres. And we showed that uh, the forest Forest Service uh, owned 24% of that, and of the amount uh, that could be harvested what, from our native lands was 0.6% uh, from the large tree habitat. So in Southeast Alaska, 76% 76 of the large tree habitat is protected. So there are really a lot of misconceptions uh, around uh, around our our past um, land land use practices. Now I'm not going to say that we didn't make mistakes. We have made mistakes, but we said we are going to you know we wanted to take a different uh, we wanted to take a different route for our future. Uh, we wanted to make sure that our cultural values could be in place, that we could protect our land uh, for our future generations. Uh, we have a saying that we've Native people have lived here in Southeast Alaska for 10,000 years, and it is our responsibility to make sure that they are able to live here for another 10,000 years. So um, uh, we're doing everything that we can to the best of our ability with the current knowledge of science, you know, to protect our, our land base. Um, so, and I mentioned, you know, the tree ceremony, and I said this is really important for us to do as Native people. You know, we believe that everything has a spirit, including trees. And so, uh, at the beginning of every year, uh, we have the first tree ceremony, and uh, our CEO, very different from any other CEO, uh, goes and talks to the spirit of the trees, and he tells the uh, spirit of the tree that he's going to use use the tree in ways that provide economic uh, and employment benefits for our tribal members and our communities, and that uh, our income will be used to support our native languages, culture, and heritage programs, our scholarships and internships. Uh, we're going to use it for political advocacy for our tribal members, and also we are going to use some of it to to reinvest in the management of our land and our forests, and also a continuing studies of our, of our ecosystems. And so here you see um, uh, some of us at, at our tree ceremony in 2012. And um, I, I note here that between 1992 and, and 2010, we've invested $19 million in forest management practices to ensure that our timber harvests are sustainable. Um, some of the other things that we've done, and we'll just go over those quickly. Uh, we do th three uh, tree thinning, and, and here you could look at the difference between a, a thinned stand uh, and an unmanaged stand. This is 15 years after harvest. Uh, we also uh, regenerate uh, the forest by uh, replanting. Um, and uh, we've replanted in 1.6 million uh, uh, seedlings to assist in the regeneration of the, uh, the forest in areas where natural regeneration will take longer. We also do basal pruning, and um, this is really important for uh, the, uh, the underbrush. Uh, 
for it uh, for it to grow and then also it allows our trees to grow stronger and healthier and here is a landscape uh, of age 20 to 25 and this is a managed uh, landscape and I mentioned you know that we are doing our you know our very best to to implement carbon sequestration uh, practices uh, on our land and um, in addition to that, um, we have um, uh, what we did was we went through and we looked at all of our practices and uh, we developed a comprehensive land policy based on our cultural values. And so right now it, it's, it's kind of an umbrella comprehensive land policy. And right now we're, we're going through the process of adding and elaborating on you know what those policies mean and try to translate that into two procedures. So um, in conclusion, uh, what we are trying to use is we have you, have you seen historically how we use Western institutions and now how we are using science to protect our traditional values and lifestyle and how we are trying to protect our culture and our subsistence hunting and fishing and also how uh, we are the new practices that we are 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 implementing and other so along with some of our other investments we actually just went through a process where we divested ourselves of, of some profitable companies other companies that were too remote from our region and so we got rid of all of those companies and now we have a new investment policy and we're trying to bring our, our investment uh, and our acquisitions closer to home so that they could provide more direct economic benefits uh, to, our, to our tribal members and our communities. So here we are using uh, in some our cultural values and Western science in, in managing our forest lands for future generations. So there you have it, and I want to thank you for, uh, for, for this. I think I made it in one hour. Did I make it in one hour? So I guess we'll go ahead and turn it back to you, George. That was uh, an absolutely illuminating uh, talk, Rosita, in terms of your comprehensive land uh, policy. And what you've demonstrated is how well traditional, so, uh, traditional uh, knowledge and science can walk together. You've also demonstrated the importance of a view of, of heritage that is integrated, that's holistic, in the sense that you can't care for heritage sites without caring for the environment. And you can't mm -hmm. care for the environment without caring for the people and you can't care for the people without protecting the environment. And that is really integrated into um, the Sea Alaska approach to heritage conservation, heritage management, that is wrapped around those four key co core values that you, you've outlined. Uh, we have time for questions, so let me just turn this over to the audience. Who would like the first question? Yes, please. I find it. Thank you so much, Dr. Worrell, for your presentation. Um, I, I, I'd love to hear more. I think you've outlined one of the greatest challenges of any traditional culture in trying to somehow grapple with modern institutions which were not designed to, put, to protect the values that you want to protect. And, my, my information is quite old, but I heard a lot about the early history of Sea Alaska and forest harvesting. And one of the one of the stories that I heard, which I'd like to hear your perspective on, is that uh, the taxes imposed on Sea Alaska at the time forced it to do things that it didn't want to do. And so I'm curious: Have you been able to? Um, have you been able to do anything about the tax structure? Of course, we know that as neoliberalism came into play in the 1980s that some corporations were 
able to pay much lighter taxes as tax mm -hmm. policy in the U.S. changed. And I'm, I'm just curious to know how Sea Alaska grappled with, uh, I mean, y you said something about how it didn't want to be a corporation, which I think all of us could understand. And could you tell us more about how it grappled with things like taxes forcing it to do things it didn't want to do, and um, if, if it was able to benefit from the tax structure, or, or have you actually tried to make yourselves not legally a corporation so that you don't okay. have to yeah. do some things that corporations are legally required to do? And have you, um, have you, in, have you managed to do what many corporations don't do, which is to have a more transparent board of directors and more accountability from your CEO. All the things that people complain about in corporations today have, I, I imagine that you have, I'd love to hear more of the story of the, the great difficulty of being a corporation. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, well, you, um, there are a lot of questions there, but I, I think first of all, you know, I, I had mentioned that one of the things that we do do is we become very involved in in Western institutions, and um, we look at, and, and I'm, I'm talking about the political process, political and legal process, and uh, we, you know, we, we try to get our people elected to Congress, uh, we support our, our, we try to get people who are friendly to us in Congress, and we work with them very closely, and we are not afraid to try to go and make changes to uh, that corporate structure. And uh, we've already had more than 100 amendments to ANCSA, and more than likely I'm, we're going back to Congress the end of the month, uh, end of, end of uh, March, and already we've got about 10 public policy issues that we want to deal with, that we want to change, we want to amend, or we want to develop that will help us develop, protect our, our, our land, our resources, and our culture. So that's one of the things that we really do uh, is it, it becomes an important part of our strategy. Uh, we're also involved in uh, at the local level in uh, citizens groups, in, um, in um, uh, public bodies that deal with, uh, we, we just spent probably five years uh, with the uh, Tongass Futures Roundtable, where we were trying to educate people about how we use the land, how we use the resources, and what could we do, how could, how could they help us, and, and what could we learn from them. And this taught us a really important lesson that um, uh, we found out it's important to educate the public about our culture, about our organizations, so that, uh, you know, from what we learned from history, that a lot of the negative impacts and the pressures on our culture and our institutions come from the outside. So we, we have, we spend a lot of time dealing with these public interest groups, but we also spend a lot of time with teachers. Now, insofar as this, the, uh, the tax, and I, I, what I think you're referring to is, I briefly mentioned that, um, that imposition of Section 7i, uh, where we are required to share 70% of our profits, 70% of our profits must be shared among all of the other 11 corporations, including ourselves. So we actually find out how much is it that we're going to make, and 70%, we take that, we divide it up into 70%, and it, it's on a population basis, and, uh, and then it goes further down into um, into the village corporations and then actually to individual shareholders. But what does this do? And it's really important here is where this is where public policy is so important. I mean, I'm sure Senator Stevens thought he was doing a great thing in terms of saying Section 7i is a great thing uh, for those re re regions that are resource rich to share with other regions that are not as resource rich or are resource poor. And uh, I was telling someone about this requirement um, uh, and one of the national boards that I sit on, and this was one of the uh, a very esteemed, I guess, 
in, from our perspective, we would call him an elder, a very esteemed elder from Wall Street. And I was, I was having dinner with a group of them, and they said, my dear, that is so un-American. That is so un-American to say that you have to share your profits. But how does this translate? How does this translate into timber harvest practices? So um, when we first started, when we first started the corporation, we would we would project how much revenues is it that we need to to uh, to sustain ourselves, to sustain our operations. So we would say, okay, we need this, and but we also have to consider that we have to share 70% of our profits have to go uh, to the other regions. So we would almost more than double our harvest. And so that's what we did in the first, in the first round. But now we've changed that practice to what can we do sustainably? What, what's the harvest level? And, and right now I will tell you um, that we're looking at a, at a much, uh, about a third of the timber harvest that we once uh, used to do. And so our, our timber harvests are gonna be much lower uh, than, uh, because we're in, we want to move towards that sustainability so that we'll never have to shut down uh, or, or harvest all at once and then shut down. We wanted something that's sustainable, that provides sustainable benefits to the entire region. And, uh, but we've had, we've had to take science, as I've mentioned, and how do we, you know, what can we do uh, to increase uh, the growth period? Uh, how much do we invest before it becomes, it, it becomes not profitable? Uh, for example, the pruning. Pruning takes a lot of money. So how much money should I spend on truly pruning? How many years should I go before I harvest? So all of that's built into that model. But uh, so now we don't pay attention to what, well, what revenues do we need? It's we're driven by what is sustainable. But on the other side of the taxation issue is um, what we call, we, we have benefited from what we call our, our net operating losses. And, that's, and that, that gets to be very complex. It was a one-time uh, situation because remember, uh, uh, most corporations, you know, they earn the money and, and then they, they develop. But here we got our, our, our land settlement and, uh, you know, and we, we proceeded to develop a corporation without this, this kind of study that we are now able to do because, number one, uh, we've, we've learned about uh, forest practices. We've learned about land stewardship. Uh, we've learned about economic diversification. We've learned about monetizing our trees uh, through mitigation banks and, and carbon sequestration. So we spend a lot of our time you know, trying to get our children. Uh, we have these summer camps to, to teach our children about our culture, but also telling them, guys, you, we need to protect this land. So it means we are going to need uh, uh, foresters. We're going to need uh, different kinds of scientists. So it's, it's really comprehensive, you know, the approach that we've taken. But that one little section on Section 7i, uh, we're not going to be able to change it. Uh, uh, we, uh, and believe me, we have looked at that. Uh, and uh, I think it's here to stay. I actually went back and spent a lot of time looking at, at that. I think, you know, that uh, Senator Stevens thought he was doing a great thing. And, and I think in the long term, it probably will prove to be beneficial. But uh, it was a lesson learned for us. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much for your talk, Dr. Worrell. Um, I'm a grad student. I'm in uh, the colloquium class with George and some other students. Um, I was, first, first of all, very just impressed with the way that um, Sea Alaska and other corporations have sort of subverted this I'd structure of a corporation and really be in a different kind of corporation. Um, I was also interested in, in what you mentioned about the, the sort of animosity between Sea Alaska and some of these conservation groups. Um, and I quickly looked up one and I found, uh, I believe it's called the Sitka Conservation Society. Oh. 
Uh -oh. <laughs> um, but but I was wondering because there have often been uh, good partnerships between indigenous groups and uh, conservationist uh, folks, and it seems like um, it's unfortunate when those two groups don't work together. Um, so I'm wondering, first of all, if there's been much of an effort to collaborate with you from some of these outside conservation groups to try and understand your perspective and work with you, or if it's just sort of been this um, acrimonious relationship. Um, well, actually, right now, we're working with uh, Nature Conservancy. We actually are partners with them, and uh, they are, I mentioned that we had established Ha'ani, um, Ha'ani Ha Ani means our land, and uh, we're, we're trying to promote development in our villages uh, so that our people could stay there, sustainable development. And Ha'ani has been very generous with us in providing funds for us uh, to give to. We're, and, and here's again, I, I kind of debated about individual entrepreneurship versus, you know, uh, um, a a, a corporation, an entity, uh, a group orientation one, and but a part, and, and I guess you have to have both. You know, I went back and looked at, you know, development uh, in other countries, and I guess you do have to have uh, individual entrepreneurship. So they have been one group that's worked with us, but I will tell you, it is very rare. We, uh, I actually would try to reach out myself, you know, uh, as as an anthropologist, as a clinket, I would say, I need to understand, you know, I need to understand what is driving you. Why are, why are we having, you know, these problems? And I said, at, at a very high level, I think we share interests, but when it comes to the implementation, uh, your idea is no use, where ours is use with protections. And um, unfortunately, and, and you mentioned the Sitka group, I have absolutely no idea how to reach out to those people. We've met, we have, we, uh, in our, in this legislation that we just obtained, well, it took us 10 years to get 70,000 acres. We spent $11 million for that land legislation. We had over 300 um, meetings with communities with conservation groups, uh, different kind of public interest groups. Uh, I flew over to Sitka uh, with other board members in, in the dark of night to meet with them. And uh, it, it has been an adversarial relationship. Um, right now, we're, we're working on one of our sacred sites outside of Sitka. And uh, we've been working, trying to get this for 40 years under ANGSA. Uh, and we still are fighting, you know, legal challenges after legal challenges to get it. And, and we have committed to, to protecting that site. I mean, it's been, we've used that site, you know, for thousands of years. Uh, you haven't seen any kind of development around it uh, because to us it's, it's a sacred area. It's a place where we fish uh, and very important to us. Uh, it's a sacred landscape to us, but yet we are, we have to fight uh, uh, these different groups, you know, to get these lands. So I don't know what to do. Uh, I, I will tell you that I was very disappointed, uh, you know, when under ANGSA, we, what did we got more than 120 million acres into conservation units, and we were working with the conservationists very closely. Uh, we supported, you know, lands going in into these conservation units. And I assume they would also work with us in protecting our subsistence. And unfortunately, you know, subsistence hunting and fishing, it means, you know, you, you've got to have a protected environment. But I will tell you, I have not had one, one conservation group come and say, Rosita or AFN or Sea Alaska, we believe in that subsistence is a, a good use of our land and resources, and it should be protected. So I don't know, you know, so if any of you have some, any ideas, you know, we're open to it. You know, when the Tongass Futures, that round table was a great idea. And, uh, but when we first started, we only had one native representative. And, you know, I went and said, well, we need to have more natives involved. And so we, over time, got the natives involved. 
and and slowly it began to deteriorate and we said we are going to be the last one at this table because we think we should work together uh, we have common interest in in protecting uh, our lands yeah so if you have any ideas let me know uh, next question uh, <clears throat> uh, at noon uh, Lugalam Zebin uh, uh, Gregory Miller, Diwayu, Lachskik Dipdeku, Gitsum Kalem Arachain Dibalwatku. I was speaking with my teacher and she mentioned uh, your work in language revitalization. Um, mm -hmm. I know in um, Prince Rupert and Terrace in the North Coast, um, Somaliak is a language option K through 12, and it's a mm -hmm. transferable credit course for universities. Um, I was mm -hmm. wondering if the Tlingit and Haida in, in Alaska were having the same uh, language revitalization in their youth, uh, and if so, uh, can you um, tell us how you got there or the, the what you've learned so far? Oh, yeah, first of all, Gunastish, Gunastish, noble person of the land. Um, yes, uh, a number of years back, uh, we, we, uh, we went to a, a meeting it was a, a National Park Service meeting, actually, and uh, there was a group of Hawaiian ladies there, and they introduced us to language revitalization. And uh, we we went to Hawaii and we looked at what they were doing, and we brought our, some of our board members back there. And I will tell you that we cried. Our our trustees cried when they saw those children speaking Hawaiian. And so we came back home and we said, for the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, language revitalization shall be our highest priority. And so the very first thing that we did was um, we brought together a group of people, uh, of our speakers. And uh, we went through a process where we said we had to train our elders that speaking our language was great, that it did not affect adversely affect your academic uh, achievement. And I guess we had been taught that, you know, if you learn another language, it would hurt you. But the other thing that we did was we, and this is our philosophy, is you'll never save the language and culture from Sea Alaska Plaza One, but it has to be community-based. And the other thing we learned is, uh, as much as I love the work of linguists, uh, and when we first started our program, I ended up, uh, I started off with language community programs, and I ended up with five uh, linguists on my staff, and I, the program slowly turn, turned to study of language. So I fired all five of them, and, we, and so we've developed the model ourselves, and it's been a learning process for us, um, and uh, I will say right now that if you go into one of our villages, you will hear our youth speaking the language, and they will have to have a microphone to interpret for their parents. And here in the Juno schools, uh, we have um, we have about 500 young children learning our language. I mean, we've worked at you know at multiple levels. We went in, uh, started to seek federal funding for it. We tried to change uh, the state law, and uh, so we just and so I would say we're we're. We're, we're fairly successful. Whether it will be spoken as a first language in the way that it once was, uh, I don't know. But I will tell you that, uh, as we say, the voices of our ancestors are going to be heard on this land. And the success of our program programs now, I think, attest to that. And I, I've been meaning to write a paper on our success because we just had an immersion program where we um, uh, tested all of our, and they call themselves language learners, they're, but they are also teachers. And, and this was another uh, thing that we did was we, um, we started a teaching program to, to train native teachers, and we made language acquisition part of that. And so those are the ones that came back into the schools and are now teaching. To me, those are the heroes, you know, are, these, um, are these language learners. So um, we'll try to write a, a paper on it just to show and go through some of the methods that we've developed uh, uh, to help us achieve some success. Another question? Hi, Rosita. Thank you so much. My name's Tom. 
Um, I just wanted to ask you just as a super, super lay person about a lot of what you're talking about. Um, it looked to me like a lot of your practices um, around what the corporation was doing were really, really great. But I don't really know very much about the practices of other resource extraction corporations. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could give us a sense, uh, like on a scale of one to 10, the average non-native corporation, what kind of a grade you would give them, one being terrible and 10 being perfect, and then where you would place yourselves on that scale, just so I can get a sense of where you guys feel you're at. And then there's a second part to it. I realize that's really hard. The second part to it is that I was also just wondering if you could tell us about collaboration between your corporation and non-native corporations, whether or not they're coming to you to learn from you guys about what you're doing and, and what that relationship looks like. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, uh, I think, well, I, you know, I, I, I know Sea Alaska so intimately because, I, you know, I've been working at it for any number of years now. And, um, you know, I, I think we are trying our very best. And I, I think we're on the right path. I think we have, you know, we have the values in place. We have operations that are, are really trying to integrate it. And when you hear our CEOs talking about it, and, and uh, you know that you're, you've made some success when, they, when they're talking about it. Um, but if I had to say, you know, are, are we fully a corporation where we could say that we've implemented our values in action 100%? I would probably say no, not yet, but I, I would say we're probably maybe 60, 70%. I think we're, we're, we're moving towards that. Uh, I would say, and I'm looking at like corporations, um, if, if I were, and, and I, even looking at Forest Service, you know, I know Forest Service is open to, uh, to learning from us, like we've learned a lot uh, about uh, second growth, and so and and Forest Service is the government agency. You know they don't always have the money, uh, so we we will you know try to help them, and they'll try to help us as well. So we have a good relationship with them. Um, other other corporations, uh, and I know that there are other uh, native corporations that uh, are timber corporations. I would say. I, I don't know any of them that are that are, you know, following our our uh, at, at least in a methodical way, following our our way. Uh, I know I'm just thinking about Chugach, Fognac, you know, some of those others. Um, I, I don't see them doing that yet, but I, I might not know about about them. I do know that a lot of them will invest uh, in cultural and economic activities. They will give money, you know, to these kinds of things. But I don't know that they're taking the corporation uh, itself. But I know that Chugach has, you know, they called and asked Rosita, would you would you share with us? So we, you know, we have shared with them, you know, some of the things that we're doing. So it could be, you know, that they, they may be trying to do that. But insofar as other corporations, coming to us. Uh, I don't see other corporations coming to us yet. And part of it is that we're not telling our story in the way that we think we should. And so, I mean, that was a determination that we made uh, probably two years ago. And we said we're, we're beefing up our, our corporate communication um, uh, department so that we could tell our story, so that others could see what we're doing. And I don't know if you've seen the advertisement, but we're recruiting for a corporate communications director to help us. That would be, you know, help us tell our story better. <coughs> I will tell you that we are, we've had visits from other indigenous groups throughout the world. And uh, I will tell you, I've been invited to uh, two different places around the world, you know, to present and um, to be present some of our work on our land stewardship. So I know some of the word, word is getting out there, but I think we've got a lot more to do. Mm -hmm. I think we have another question here. Uh, 
excellent talk. Very fascinating. Um, I don't know if you have the figures on hand, but I was wondering what percent of the timber harvest profits go into the cultural revitalization programs that you uh, mentioned a few slides back. Uh, well, I did. Um, I'm doing an anxious study, <laughs> uh, and I, I said, "Oh my God, it's getting to be like my dissertation years and years." And um, when I first came uh, in, and I wanted to see how much money were we spending uh, from our corporate in our corporate headquarters, in um, uh, in our our mission objectives, and it was 20%. It was. 20% of our staff time, 20% of our, our, our revenues were going to mission objectives. And that is, you know, supporting, uh, supporting us, the uh, Alaska Heritage, money into scholarships, money into the Alaska Federation of Natives, uh, money for, to donations for health. Um, um, I, I, so at that, that one point in time, I'd say it's probably the same 20%, and of course our, our corporate coffers go up and down. Um, our, our annual revenues uh, go up and down, but I think 20% is a good amount. If I looked at the total amount, uh, I, I look at our scholarships. We've in the years we've had it, we've probably uh, put in more than six million dollars from just one account, and I, I haven't counted the other account. And but uh, every year, Sea Alaska gives Sea Alaska Heritage 1.23 million dollar, and uh, we generate uh, probably another 10, 11 million dollars from that. So their their investment uh, generates additional social cultural uh, resources. So, but overall, I, I don't know that I could say total. But I'm working on it. I think we have time for a final question here. Oh, um, well, first of all, I want to say how much I'm enjoying uh, the sight of your jacket and the design oh. that's on it. Um, but I was wondering, um, first of all, has your um, group of indigenous people ever been interrupted culturally the way has happened so shamefully here in Canada with the residential schools because it strikes me as I hear you talk about your various struggles and which have been heroic there's been an amazing um, matching connection between the Western culture I'll call it that and and your own and and how you found um, the capacity to come to some kind of understanding. This seems to be seriously lacking here in Canada from what I know of our people. And I just wonder, have you witnessed, mm -hmm. have you experienced the same struggles or? Oh yes, oh yes, uh-huh. Yeah, um, uh, I, I will tell you, um, um, I, it, it's, been, been, it's been bad. Yes, uh, I don't know. I, I was really surprised when I went onto your website and saw, oh my God, they've got that, you know, that uh, video about myself. Mm -hmm. And I and um, uh, I grew up during a period, you know, when uh, we were forced to go to uh, boarding schools. I mean, I was actually I was one of those kids kidnapped and and brought to a school, and our language you know, was beat out of us. Oh, yes. And um, that, you know, happened up and down the coast. And um, uh, so our languages, uh, although our potlatches weren't outright banned in the same way yours were, uh, uh, ours were discouraged. And, uh, and I remember growing up as a child, we would have to um, secretly have our ceremonies. And if we heard a plane coming in, then we'd have to run around and act like we were doing nothing, you know, doing something uh, else. Yes. Uh, I will tell you that if I had to go through, if we, going through this 10 years of our trying to get our land claims, our final land entitlement, I was very surprised at, at the over racism that we encountered. And, and it's not just, it's not just us, it's our children. Uh, I like to think it's getting better I really do, but unfortunately, uh, I, I think we still have to deal with um, with many instances 
uh, and systemic issues, you know, of racism. Um, I mean, we, you know, we're back in Congress trying to get the, our Voting Rights Act uh, uh, because the state of Alaska said there's no discrimination in Alaska, but yet they closed down polling booths in in our villages, uh, just other kinds of things. Uh, we've been trying to get uh, the word native into uh, the into the statehood song, um, but we can't get that word native in there. I mean, it, unfortunately, it's still here, but it has gotten better. And uh, we always remind people that, you know, we're teaching our, chil our children our values, and they're going to be smarter than us. And because they're becoming more educated than us, and we keep telling them, you know, we're not going to give up on our language, culture, and, and our way, our way of life. So um, I always tell uh, those politicians, be prepared for the long haul, because we're in for it the long haul. Thank you. Uh, what you've told me simply uh, makes it all the more impressive what you've managed to uh, accomplish up to now to find a common ground. So thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Yes, thank, you. thank you so much, Rosita. This has just been a wonderful opportunity to have you share your knowledge, your experience, and, and, and so much more with us. We have a gift that I will be conveying to you at some point in the near future. And on behalf of uh, SFU President Andrew Petter and everyone here at SFU, please join me again in giving Rosita a Thank you. Thank you very much.